Hey guys, I'm on the road today, so slightly different uh, recording setup, but I can't be too precious about these things. Um, today, I'm re-recording an abridged version of a talk that I was invited to prepare for the Financial Modeling Institute a couple of weeks ago. If you're a financial modeler, you should check them out. They're a great learning resource, and there's zero kickbacks or benefits for me saying that. It's just an honest opinion. As you may know, I began my blockchain career because I was spotted for being seriously good at handling spreadsheets. And that remains a really critical skill in my arsenal. But at the same time, I know it has some limits. So I created this talk for the financial modeling community to make them aware of how their skills are going to be valuable in the blockchain revolution, and also to bring them to some awareness of the limitations that these approaches may have that they may never have thought about, a marking situations where they may be better off learning how to work with new tools, or passing their work on to other kinds of specialized quantitative modelers. So let's begin with a simple question. What is a financial model? Well, fundamentally, it's a stock and flow model, which tracks movements, accumulations, and depletions of resources over time. And systems that are often represented with a diagram, like the one shown on the right. Typically, we're focused on resource movements that are created by a business-driven process. Money is the main resource of interest, and the financial value of non-monetary resources in the system are frequently emphasized. And that's one of the reasons why we call it financial modeling. And very importantly, all these projections are codified and reported in the language of financial accounting. That means that our models frequently include full accounting projections for the business that include the income statement, cash flow statement, the concepts that map to the flows in our system and which allow us to distinguish between the flow of economic events and the flow of cash itself. And then the balance sheet, which maps onto the resource stocks that are being modeled. Now, this accounting literacy, I'm going to argue, is one of the key value add areas for this skill set. Why is accounting valuable? Well, it's essentially like an object model for most business processes. One that's been developed to highlight important recurring distinctions in uh, terms of what the process does and how it's managed. It's also something that managers and financiers have been trained to read to improve their management and financial decision making. This general language is also really valuable for allowing us to make comparisons between different kinds of businesses by expressing them in common terms. We can ask things like, what are your profits as a share? of your revenues? How many days is your working capital tied up in your business before it's free to be paid out of the business as profit? What's the ratio of your liquid assets to the short-term liabilities that are coming due? And so on and so forth. Another characteristic feature of the financial modeling skill set is that the models are built in spreadsheet software. This creates a visually accessible environment that's inclusive for key decision makers. And the modelers leverage that visual environment to make strong distinctions between input assumptions and the model outputs. That helps to build better models because it gets us to focus on isolating what the key drivers of a business are. Things like how many customers do you have? How much do they spend? What's the interest on your debt? And so on. It's also worth noting that a trained financial modeler has learned to leverage this software extremely well. And part of the skill set includes knowing all the ins and outs of these amazing programs to make them do things that most people think are impossible, to be able to work quickly, and to build tools that follow battle-tested design patterns that reduce errors and maximize auditability. A further advantage is that risk exploration is a common part of our toolkit and practice and is frequently included in the model outputs we create tables that report KPIs under different driver values, spider diagrams and tornado charts that explore sensitivities of key drivers, and we conduct scenario analysis that stacks adverse assumptions on top of each other or else allow us to represent specific possible events of concern. So all of this presents the value add of financial modeling in a really general purpose way, but I think it's fair to examine that a little more closely and ask, is financial modeling specialized or general purpose? The reason why I ask that is because financial modeling talent is typically cultivated in a way that tends towards specialization. First reason for that 
is that financial modeling is frequently regarded as an interim skill set, something that you do in the first three or four years of a financial career before you move into other kinds of roles that don't have anything to do with modeling anymore. So you may not diversify out of a business niche in that time. Second reason is that even if you do stay on as a hands-on modeler, you frequently will earn a premium if you specialize in a specific niche, which may also limit the diversity of your modeling experience. Now, I was fortunate enough to work freelance as a modeling consultant and get exposure to a diverse range of problems and situations, having to build models for operational businesses that integrated live data from a point of sale terminals, building models for startup pitches, project finance models, real estate models, and so on and so forth. And I really do think that helped me shift into blockchain. The obvious benefit being that I'd had more exposure to a varied set of business structures and decision-making concerns. But I also benefited from a few other important insights. First of all, there is no right way to do financial modeling. Frequently, it is the business norms and culture that matter more to the way the model is put together than what is being modeled by it. And this invited me to think about modeling choices in higher level terms rather than just thinking about a specific style of modeling and taking it as received wisdom, which is what you're normally trained to do. All this has helped me model entirely new economic situations in a blockchain context and to have the courage to be proactive about deciding what the right approach should be. But if you are someone who likes to zero in on a specialism, not having this more open-ended flexibility won't exclude you from taking part in this field. We shall see in a minute that there are plenty of conventional business models that are going to migrate on chain that are still going to be well served by financial models that only have modest extensions to take tokens into account. But for those of you who enjoy the more open-ended problem solving of your modeling work, I think you're going to have some great opportunities to be creative with your skill set in ways that you may not have had the chance to experience in your career so far. Okay, so let's take stock of where we are for a second. We're exploring how and why financial modeling and blockchain are a good fit for each other. We've been focused on the financial modeling side. Now it's time to turn over to the blockchain side. Let's begin by describing as succinctly as possible what the core economic benefits of blockchain technology are. A lot of it boils down to giving us better ways to transfer and exchange resources and to execute economic agreements and business logic. This derives from blockchains enabling disintermediated interaction, enabling direct economic interaction without middle third parties and their extensive programmability and automation which allow us to predefine and execute complex actions securely and reliably without a human agent. This underpins several potential economic efficiencies, including reduced costs and increased speed, reliability, and scalability for our business processes. So here, once again, I'm highlighting benefits that are really general purpose to argue that blockchain is going to be broadly relevant to all kinds of businesses going forward. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Major institutions have understood the opportunity that blockchain presents. And we've seen a collaboration between the Monetary Authority of Singapore, its government-backed bank, DBS, JP Morgan, and a Japanese bank, experimenting with tokenized deposits and FX transactions on a public blockchain. We've seen tokenized bonds valued in the hundreds of millions of US dollars being issued by Siemens, the European Investment Bank, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, AB and AMRO for a corporate client, and SockGen. We also see new blockchain tools being released by JP Morgan and a new partnership involving Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, and Microsoft being recently announced called Canton. We also have EY who've been working on this stuff for years and are just starting to release some of it to market. You may be able to catch up with recordings of their blockchain summit in London that they held a couple of weeks ago. It was amazing. These actors are really changing up the innovation landscape for blockchain, which I now see coalescing around two distinctive domains. On the one hand, we have a set of 
evolutionary blockchain applications. These include high quality stable coins, improved trading and payment, ERP and supply chain management, carbon management, real world asset tokenization, tokenized securities. These are evolutionary in the sense that they bring established business models and processes on chain, as we say, meaning that these processes now become implemented and executed with blockchain technology. And as you might have guessed, the second area of innovation is what I'm calling revolutionary blockchain applications, where we use the possibilities of blockchain to create entirely new business processes and economic flows altogether. Here we have blockchain infrastructure, decentralized computing, Internet of Things, decentralized autonomous organizations, Web3, a version of the Internet that allows you control and ownership over your data, realizing value from it in more flexible and varied ways. GameFi, games that allow you to take value that you've earned in a game economy and find use for it outside of the immediate game experience. Disintermediated multi-sided platforms. Think of Facebook and Amazon without a Zuckerberg or Bezos and without having to pay for all of their overhead. New, exciting opportunities to finance businesses with utility tokens, which is where I started my career. New investment instruments and token security standards and formats are all possible. You may have also heard of DeFi, decentralized finance. I put that in the middle there since some of its applications are clearly revolutionary, like decentralized exchanges, but it also has ones that are evolutionary as well, like blockchain-enabled mortgage approval systems. Now, please don't agonize too much about the precision of this classification or my choice of terms. It's just a rough summary and storification, and it also turns out to be a helpful map for our main topic of interest because financial modeling is going to be used in these areas in different ways. For evolutionary applications, financial modeling is going to retain the familiar use value that it offers the off-chain versions of these businesses to date. You may get some added blockchain flavor by having to pull analytics data directly from blockchains instead of a centralized database. And no doubt, there will be new items and adjustments you have to make for the tokens and any interactions that they may have with physical resources. But in some sense, the extension to your modeling will be incremental. It's this second group of innovations that I think invites a much more open-ended and experimental application of financial modeling skills. To explain my point, in a conventional modeling engagement, you know what business you are trying to represent, whether it's a real estate development, a mine, a software as a service business, or whatever. In these uses, a lot of business structure is set, and the financial model helps you to discover and explore parameter values that will enable that business structure to perform and to succeed. But for those more innovative designs, you may be using the financial model to guide deeper choices about what the structure of the business process is in the first place. And that is quite different to what a lot of modelers are used to doing. So what are the strengths of financial modeling for this deeper design exercise? I think a lot of it comes down to our accountancy training. I don't mean that our blockchain models have to contain full accounting projections each and every single time. I'm talking about the way that this training makes us think about business problems, with the number one benefit being that we count stuff. Our models match counts of value with counts of events and resource units. Now, this may sound like it's unbelievably basic, but it can really help to cut through a lot of confusion that exists in these exercises where we can create and destroy tokens at will and enable these long, complex multi-party transfers and bring in speculative value from token exchange markets that has absolutely nothing to do with the fundamental economic process. The next feather in our cap is our general business knowledge, which includes an understanding of balance sheets and the different implications of different sorts of assets and liabilities, our conceptual library of ways to measure business performance, scaling, and risk. And even when our skills aren't up to the task of modeling some exceptionally complex economic design, they are unlikely to be totally irrelevant. I've had conversations with sophisticated token engineers who feel comfortable creating an agent-based economic model in Python, but not to connect that up with a view of how that broader economic process supports and sustains a core business process that's essential for the economy to continue to function. 
Finally, any general skills we've developed around budgeting and financial planning are also immensely valuable. But a strong word of caution here. Many of us have not cultivated the skills and knowledge necessary to offer support to businesses that have treasuries with large portions of their treasuries at risk in volatile market traded securities, which is essentially what all of these startup sized businesses are signing up to when they issue publicly traded blockchain tokens. OK, so now let's turn to examine the situations where financial modeling may not be enough, where the model is meant to design or evaluate systems which include complex feedback effects or else are driven by diverse, non-deterministic, independent economic agents. To illustrate what I mean, consider the way we typically model revenues in a financial model. Now, revenues are clearly one of the most important business drivers for a business's success. And yet, if you think about it, modelers treat it in a very hands-off way. It is either a given assumption that doesn't depend on any deeper calculations, or it's generated by high-level calculations that reference industry benchmarks or past performance. Our model does not contain calculation logic that represents the buying behavior that generates this revenue process. But for a lot of those more experimental blockchain applications, the design goals of the exercise include the development of mechanisms that are aimed at influencing buyer behavior. In order for the model to be able to inform those kinds of decisions, we need to be able to specify richer calculations for the revenue process within the model itself. So why can't we do that in a spreadsheet? Well, fortunately, it frequently gets real messy. As you can see from the diagram, these kinds of systems typically generate feedback effects between their interacting parts, and that often creates unexpected dynamics for key variables of interest. Let's illustrate this with some charts. So imagine we're keeping an eye on how our new managed revenue process affects the cash balance of our business entity over time. Let's suppose that this arrow represents changes in the parameter values driving those revenues with more favorable values up at the top and less favorable values going in the other direction. If we use a typical financial model to vary our revenue drivers to determine which values make the business sustainable, we may find these sorts of charts at the extreme ends of the spectrum. Running out of cash is an event of failure, as you can see at the bottom there, which is why it's marked with a red X. Now, we could use the model to discover a break-even point in the middle where the business only just becomes sustainable. However, if a system has feedback in it, we can get some really strange outcomes. The charts at the top and the bottom of the range could be exactly the same as the ones we got before, but somewhere in the middle, we get some weird dynamics like these oscillations that you can see in the cash balance there. These oscillations could trigger multiple failures or bring us dangerously close to them, and yet they may not be picked up by traditional modeling methods which do not perform comprehensive sweeps of all the combinations of parameter values that could be relevant. This chart also helps make clear that there is a risk to our conventional practice of aggregating events over time. If we represent events in months, quarters, or years, we may be missing out on those fluctuations if they happen inside those time windows. But it is impractical to make our time steps more fine-grained. There are just simply not enough columns in Excel and it would make our tools way too heavy to calculate and manage effectively. Now, it turns out that complex agency has similar implications. If we're dealing with systems that are driven by agents that are non-deterministic, independent actors and heterogeneous or diverse, there's a bigger range of outcomes to explore again. We need statistical methods to specify these dynamics in the first place, to run the model and to analyze its output. Feedback effects, again, are also more likely. These are issues that we never have to think about as financial modelers because our models typically focus on a highly controllable and coordinated process, the actions of a business entity. Now, most of us are simply unaware of how much our modeling task is simplified by the implicit assumption that management direction can be effectively implemented throughout a company structure. But again, on the experimental side of blockchain, that is what we're frequently interested in, designing and evaluating systems that are driven by diverse, 
independent agents who don't share strong alignment or coordination, with the aim being to design mechanisms that create alignment out of their freely chosen actions without implementing a hierarchical control structure. Okay, so what do we make of all this? It certainly looks like there are important cases where we can't apply financial modeling techniques, but it is a lazy argument to say that just because financial modeling has limitations, it is never worth using. In this talk, I've been trying to argue to the contrary, that there are clearly situations where financial modeling methods are a great choice. So let's try and distill and summarize our ideas through a list of situations where financial modeling is the right tool for the job. For modeling a process where an economic activity is dominated by a centrally managed process, I think that financial modeling is appropriate because feedback and agent independence are unlikely to be relevant to that system. If we're interested in designing simple incentives for a conventional one-sided business process, think coupons and loyalty points, I think that financial modeling is suitable and up to the task here. We're modeling a more complex process, but the model is only needed for an early prototype or proof of concept to be used for an early fundraise round. Financial modeling could be appropriate if it's then taken over by more sophisticated tools. And then finally, if we have a situation where we think there is no feedback between business functions and the rest of the economy, or that the financial analysis can be separated from wider economic modeling in some kind of way, then limited use of financial modeling is appropriate. We have a precedent for this in the way we create financial modelings for renewable energy projects, where trained engineers will model the weather patterns and variability in generator output in Python, and then financial modelers will take the key data results and incorporate that into a centralized financial model that informs the decision-making and financial planning for the project. So I want to stress in closing that these are very much my own opinions at this stage. There are very few people who are working on these issues that have the same degree of experience and familiarity with financial modeling. I've yet to meet you. So please consider these ideas as being proposals for the tokenomic community for your comment and development. So tell me, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you.